we're singing glory to his name. Can we sing that verse one more time? Oh, precious fountain. Oh, precious fountain that saves from sin. I am so glad. I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves. There Jesus saves. And he keeps me, me and clean. Keeps me clean. And I'm singing glory to his name. We're singing glory, glory, oh, glory. His precious, precious name, name was singing. Glory to his name. There to my heart. There to my heart was the blood applied. I'm singing. Glory to his name. Why won't you come to this fountain? Come to this fountain. It's so, so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor Cast soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today, in today and be made complete. Yes, we're singing glory to his name. I'm singing glory to his name. Glory to his name. His precious name singing. Glory to his name. There to my heart. There to my heart was the blood of life. We're singing. presence of the Lord. In this same spirit of praise and worship and adoration to the Lord, we're opening the floor for testimonies. There are testimonies in the house. You just have to take a second to just think on his goodness. The enemy doesn't want you to remember it, but the Lord is enlightening you right now to remember his goodness. Who will be first?
Grace and peace. God bless you, Tisha. God bless you, Rosie. Jamaica, Jamaica, we have one of the greatest opportunity that God can give any nation, and that is to make our nation well again. Let's band together and make Jamaica well again. Make Jamaica well again. Make Jamaica well again. Hello Jamaica, we're so happy to be here. This is Word Alive Health and Wellness Festival. What does that mean? That we're here to minister to people in terms of intervention. We have doctors, nurses, dentists, touching people, making them well. But we're also talking about prevention. How can we eat better? How can we exercise differently? How can we live better with each other? How can we worship God with a different attitude? That's what we mean by making Jamaica well again. It's a holistic approach to life. Jesus died to give us the power to live differently in a cruel and evil world. And we came to help you live in Jamaica differently. So we have this clinic at Wafit under the leadership of Bishop Courtney McLean in partnership with Best Breast Chicken and High Pro and so many others, making sure that we leave an impression on your heart that you deserve to be well. God died to make you well. And we're working with you in the area of changing your way of thinking, changing the way we deal with each other. No more violence, no more cutlass, you know, peace. We want to make this country well. God bless you. You know, God has said that the church should let its light shine. That men may what? See or good work and glorify the Father. And that's what Worship and Faith International Fellowship, in collaboration with Word Alive, is doing right now. Lives are being touched. Lives are being transformed. We want to make Jamaica well again. Worship and Faith has always had this vision of impacting lives, building people up. And listen, lives are being impacted. The church is indeed rising up and the church is creating a major, major impact. We are making Jamaica well again. Well, we're here today. Jamaica Broilers Group chose to partner with Bishop McCullough and the Word Alive Ministry uh, to be a part of this mission that's taking place starting today, going until Friday. Um, we are located within St. Catherine and particularly Spanish Town is in our backyard. Um, we are very involved in our community and we saw this as a great opportunity in our 60th year to give back to our community. Um, for Best Rest Chicken, this was like a no-brainer for us. Um, our mantra, we sell chicken across Jamaica. We're the number one chicken provider, but our, our mission is never to just sell chicken, it's to impact lives. So this partnership was just a no-brainer for us, you know. So when Bishop came to us, it was like, for sure, it's in our community. It's what we do. We take care of people and we take care of lives while giving nutrition. <laughs> so this was this was perfect for us. Um, we see a lot of people out, and so we're just looking forward to just, you know, it's back to school time, and a lot of time this is hard for people to get like dental and medical and so forth. Us, it's just very heartwarming to see people come out and just to give them the care that they need to get them back to school and ready. So that's why we really wanted to partner with Bishop McCullough for this mission. I'm Chris Tufton, Minister of Health, Jamaica. Um, it's really a wonderful experience um, to witness the significant contribution to public health and wellness that Bishop McCullough and her World Alive team have brought here. Um, to St. Catherine. They are here, they are getting counseling, they are getting advice, they are getting treatment, they are getting medication, they are getting equipment in some instances. Let me use this opportunity to say how much gratitude and thanks 
to the organizers of this event, the sponsors, the participants. I see hundreds of people, both adult, middle age, old age, kids that are being cared for. I see persons uh, getting dental care, persons getting optical care, persons being treated for uh, lifestyle diseases, diabetes, hypertension. Also, I see persons being uh, cared for wellness. And I just want to say on behalf of the citizens that this kind of venture is the kind of thing that keep this country alive and well. I'm Bevan Morrison, president of the Call Foundation for the Environment and Sustainable Development. Now more than ever, Jamaica needs Jesus. Word Alive is making the word come alive in our families, in our communities, and in the nation of Jamaica. The role of the Call Foundation was to be one of the local partners for Bishop McCullough and Beth Rafa and Word Alive. We were pleased to work with government, private sector, and other charitable organizations to make this thing happen. So we worked with the Ministry of Health, ensured that we could help to clear the two containers of medicines, pharmaceuticals, and other materials they had in the container. We worked to register all the medical team we asked the Jamaica Tourist Board and the Airports Authority to meet and greet the delegates so when they come into Jamaica, they know good Jamaican hospitality. We look forward to seeing this mission come again and to hold hands and to extend hands between Jamaicans here and abroad. Thank you. Our team has been working very closely with Word Alive Ministries from earlier this year in helping to collaborate for this very important mission here in Spanish Town, Jamaica. We have been very, very privileged to be a part of the team, working alongside the Word Alive Ministries team and also being afforded the privilege to be able to help this very important community. What was also very interesting too was that you have a pharmaceutical component, so persons who were in need of um, medicines and so on, they could have been able to access those well needed um, supplies. And so, it, all around, it has been a very, very positive experience, making a tremendous impact and difference for the people here in Spanish Town and its environs. Our mission through Lions Clubs International is that of site preservation. And so when we're asked to partner with this group, it was our joy and pleasure and we we're so happy to be a part of this that we came in on board to be here every day of this clinic. Thing is, I've really been somewhat stumped by the enormity of this clinic. I've not seen one like it before and it may be difficult to rival what we have seen here because the outreach is so massive that it's been on over the last four days and we're still without space to take very many others who'd want to come in. So as Lions, we are here giving of ourselves to this mission and this mission is one that is very well received by the people here in Spanish Town. But then I've also been advised that most people are coming from right across the island to avail themselves of these services. It's been a wonderful four days and we are proud as Lions from Lions Clubs International to be here serving this cause. Indeed, you have made my heart very glad this morning. Just last week, I prayed on the institution and I asked the Lord to really make way where there is no way and so on. And this morning when I got the call, I didn't expect it so quickly, but I'm happy that you are here. I must give a very special thank you to Bishop Jacqueline McCullough, who could have kept it to herself, however, being in the institution in the, uh, the parish and especially knowing that 
we have been having a lot of issues with resources and they are trying I'm happy for the, the public partnership that we are having here and so I believe in it and seeing it is happening so I give thanks special thanks to her Bishop Jacqueline McCullough organization World Al Alive indeed I can see you are doing a great job across the, 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 the world here we're always say world alive it's world alive to me because you're making us all alive by what you do organization so that today charlene marshall davis director of nursing services can be a recipient of this awesome job that you have done and also my one of my nurses with the user stage and the person from the the stores so thank you thank you thank you we are very grateful that's how we know we are home. Everybody sing. Oh, 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 oh. Make Jamaica well again. Hey, oh my ears out. Everybody sing. Oh, 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 oh. Make Jamaica well again. Hey, hey. Lord, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for caring for us. We thank you for giving us the power and the ability to bring changes. You came to earth to give us the power, God, to be transformed. Therefore, we're seizing the opportunity to change our nation. Our children can have a secured future because our nation has been transformed by your power in us and through us. Give us the power. Give us the resolve. Give us your word. Give us your strength so that we can make Jamaica well again. In Jesus' name, amen. You're always welcome. Amen. And if you go to the Bahamas, we'll give you their address. They really know how to take care of you. Amen. They'll try to keep you down there. They don't like for you to leave them. <clears throat> okay, the doors of the church are open even in the noonday. So we, our noonday prayer is really picking up. Remnant men will be meeting tomorrow night and Christmas Eve service at 8 p.m. Um, so we'll have this service before Christmas Day like we did for <clears throat> Thanksgiving. Amen. I'm just going to ask you to turn your Bibles now. We're, this is the fourth this is the fourth sermon on the church. Is that right, you all? Yes. <laughs> Amen. The first sermon from Ephesians, we talked about order in the church. Then we went to the purpose of the church. And then the last one was the protection of the church, if you remember. And we're in Ephesians. Now we're going to talk about the promotion of the church. How is the church promoted, okay? All right, so I'm going to ask you to turn to our theme scripture, which is Ephesians chapter 4. <laughs> and um, I'm going to ask you to stand and join me. And we're just going to read verses 11 through 15. <coughs> That's Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 15. We say good morning to our streamers. We hope that you had a very happy, glorious, and wonderful Thanksgiving. Amen? Amen. Here begins the reading of God's holy word of Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slate of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. And the text, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, 
which is the head, even Christ. So, Father, reading and hearing of God's word, please be seated. Thank you for standing. The title is The Promotion of the Church. How is the church promoted? You know, advertisement business was really great heretofore before we had Facebook and Instagram and web, web pages. People no longer, I'm sure companies use advertising agencies, but people can promote themselves of little and no cost. They, knew, they know how you know you can go on there and teach them how, how you braided your hair, you know, how you iron your clothes, any little thing. You can promote yourself. You know, you can develop a brand. You know, the people are recognized by their branding. Okay, that's one of the words they use. I don't know if they've changed it because they change words so, so quickly. But you have your branding, you have your taglines, that really, you have your logo. The first thing they tell you when you want to start a business is get a logo and get a card. So that as soon as people see the card and the logo or your letterhead, they'll know, oh, this is so-and-so, this is so-and-so. Because you're what? Promoting yourself. You're putting yourself out there. You want to be perceived a certain way. You want to be seen and remembered. This is what Walmart does. This is what Purdue Chicken offers. This is what, you know, CVS has a wonderful commercial anymore. It's no longer about drugs. It's about, I love CVS because now they're doing so many other things other than just filling your prescription. Everybody has what? A promotional tagline so that as soon as you hear the name, see the logo, you will know what it is. Amen? Well, the church is to be promoted a certain way. And unfortunately, we have taken the church and we have misrepresented it in the community. We have promoted it wrongly. Amen. And the church needs to go back to this scripture to find out how should we present, promote, you know, the church. How should we talk about the church? What is the church known for? What is the key aspect of the church in this scripture. We know Ephesians was one of the prison epistles. It was written by Paul along with Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon while he was in prison. A powerful epistle that talks about Christ being the head of the church and we being the body. So that relationship between head and body is strong illustration in Ephesians. How does your head and body work? So if you can kind of figure that out, then you can understand how the head and the body of Christ should work together. Whatever your brain is saying, your body is doing. Whatever the brain is dictating, that's what the body should do. Now, when something is wrong with our head and wrong with our, 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 our brain or whatever, you feel it in your body. You feel it in your toe. And you feel it, I cut my finger on, on Thanksgiving, and I, and I felt it all over. You know what I'm saying? So you can just mash your toe, as they would say, and your whole body goes in. That's how n tightly knit, that's how interconnected we are. But that's for the last sermon. Today we're talking about promoting the church. The second part of Ephesians talks about practical things, how it works. How does this work? We know, we know theoretically, body and head, head and body, but how does it pan out in our relationship as a community? How does it pan out in your relationship with your family? How does it pan out in your relationship in your business? So it's one thing to understand something theoretically, but it's another thing on how to do it, how to do it, okay? So that's what Ephesians will tell you what it is theoretically, and how to do it in a practical way. But this particular verse tells you how the church should be promoted, speaking the truth in love. So the church has something to say. The one thing that you have to say when you're promoting the church, if you're going to brand the church or tagline the church, the church has a voice. Tell your neighbor, the church has a voice. What's wrong with the church today? Either we're not saying anything or we're saying the wrong thing. 
We are misrepresenting the church. So this voice, I was reading in my meditation this morning where Jesus was saying um, to the Pharisees in St. John, the seventh chapter, or the community, he says, I did not come to say anything of my own. Whatever I have to say, I'm saying what the Father told me to say. So the church is not supposed to say something of its own. We're not here to promote a specialty about our church. And that's where the church has gone wrong. We're tagline our church. Or that church is known for this. And this church is known for that. And that church has a good choir. And that church has state-of-the-art equipment. Those are the kinds of things that we use to promote the church. Or that church has, you know, a personality or a celebrity. Or that church, whatever. And now it's about choirs singing. We're promoting. But we're not promoting what Jesus organize the church. The head of the church is saying, that's not me. That, that's, not what, that's not what you were brought. I didn't bring you together. I didn't die on the cross and bring you together to represent me in the world. You are misrepresenting me. So what should the church be doing? Should be speaking the truth in love. Okay? Speaking the truth. That means that we are to herald Proclaim, declare, define, explain the truth. The church is the only institution or organism that has the truth of God, who he is, what he wants, and where we're going. The Bible says we are the pillar and ground of truth. The church is not a place for mathematicians in the sense we are not teaching mathematics, even though God superintends mathematics. But that's not the main purpose of the church. The church is not even supposed to be a social institution, even though we believe in giving. That's an outgrowth of our Christian faith. We give to the poor. We see about the needy. But that's not the main purpose of the church. The main purpose of the church is to speak the truth to testify about the person and person and, and, and purpose of Christ coming to the earth, talking about the kingdom of God. So the truth here means the truth of the gospel, not the truth of our preferences, not what we like or what we think or feel, not our certain twist in our denominational uh, uh, um, a tradition, but speaking the gospel, telling the truth, the doctrine. Truth here is doctrine. And that's a word that we don't hear in church. We don't hear doctrine. Even in this church, many, many, many people go against doctrine. You mentioned doctrine. It's almost like talking about, you know, a poison. We don't mind charisma. We don't mind entertainment and prophecy, but we don't like doctrine. And that's why the church is in trouble. Doctrine is the teachings, the orthodox teachings that pass down from Jesus to the apostles, to the first century, to the second century, all the way, the doctrines that they gave their lives for, the doctrines that they were martyred for, the doctrines that makes that will make the church distinctively different from any other organism or organization. Do you understand? Speaking the truth, the gospel, the gospel, the doctrine, the doctrine of salvation. Go to churches and you ask them, how, you, how do you know you're saved? And you get a thousand different answers. Even in the same church. What does it mean to be justified? What does it mean to be sanctified? What does it mean to be adopted? What, the, what work, what's the work of the Holy Spirit? How do you know you're filled with the Holy Spirit? What the, the Holy Spirit come in your life to do? Those are the foundational truths that make the church distinctively different from any other organization. Where are you going after you die? Is there life after death? How do you deal with suffering? How do you deal with challenges? How do you deal with anxiety? How do you deal with it when God does not come through for you the way you want him to? 
How do you deal with the fact when he says no instead of yes? All of these things have been thrown out and we have made God nothing but a Santa Claus without any teachings. Stores of foundation. When you're going through, you need to know God will never throw you away. When you're fallen and you're failed, you know that you're legally adopted and nobody can unadopt you. When, when, when you feel guilty, you, you need to go back and know, therefore being justified by faith, I have peace with God. I'm legally declared not guilty and I stand before God innocent. Do you know how many people come to church and are still, and are still in, in reeking with guilt and shame about their past? That's why they come one Sunday, they don't come the other Sunday, because they don't know their standing. They don't know their position. It doesn't matter what happens. He chose me. I did not choose him. Those are the kinds of things that will keep you from giving up on yourself from giving up when you fall down. Those are the things that will hold your life together, hold your children together. It'll give you a, a, a platform for a different kind of relationship. Every other relationship teaches you to treat people the way they behave. Only in the church we teach you to treat people even though they behave a certain way that you treat them differently. In the church, that's the teachings, forbearance. Forbearance and forgiveness. If you don't hear that in the church, you will not be able to forbear or forgive anybody. And even though we hear it, we still don't do it. Can you imagine if we never heard it? What a bunch of rebels. What a bunch of mean, evil, wicked people would exist in the world if we didn't have the understanding that when people fail, that's when we should love them more. My God, only the church teaches that. That's why the young man that forgave that police officer for, giving, for, for shooting his brother um, caused such a ruckus. Because the world doesn't understand that. It's beyond their understanding. We are, we are raised in culture, in tradition, in our flesh, to eye for an eye. We are gossipy. We are petty. We are cheap. We are low life. Only the teachings of the, of the word of God can make, we, make us walk differently. We don't know how to treat people. We don't know how to love. We don't know how to forgive unless the word of God strikes our heart and gives us the ability to do so. So if we fail to teach, we are raising a people that is now deprived of their rights, deprived of their ability, unable to reflect Christ. Look how much Christ has forgiven us. Come on, think. Wicked, wretched, cutthroat, treacherous, unresponsive, disobedient, rebellious people. And he still woke you up this morning. Huh? And he keeps on loving you. And he keeps on feeding you. He didn't starve you because you were low down. Oh, come on. He didn't throw you in the street. In spite of all of your difficulties, he still takes care of you and your family. So the church teaches the principles and the life of Christ. It's speaking the truth. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 18, 37, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause I came into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate said unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and said unto them, I find in him no fault at all. He is the truth. So if we don't teach about him, people are living a lie. If we don't hold up the truth in this church, you are prone to deception. You were born deceived, and then there's no way that you're going to get truth unless it, that's why you come to Bible study. That's why you read your Bible. That's why when you read it, you do it. 
Because that's the only truth in the world. And you shall know the truth. And the truth shall what? Set you free. So we are in a time when the church is walking in lies. And deceptions. And gimmicks. As the as verse says. The cunning devices of men. Trickiness of men. Out of their own imagination. Tricking people. Manipulating people. Because we won't hold up the truth of Jesus Christ. And then there's a certain way we have to speak it. We have to speak it in love. Amen. And that's very difficult because sometimes you have information and you know you're right. And that's when we get raunchy. <laughs> raunchy truth, yeah. It's not going to be effective when even if you're right, even if it's the truth, there's a certain way. And it's not just the way you say it. Because sometimes we can say it in a nice way, but our heart is not in it. You, ca you can correct somebody, and it sounds real strong. The truth is strong. The truth is not going to always make you feel good. The truth cuts. The truth exposes. The truth dries out darkness. The truth lets you naked to let you know what the clothes you had on was no clothes in the first place. You understand? The emperor has no clothes on. Truth comes to tell you that. Truth comes to let you know you thought you had it together, but you don't have it together. You thought that the way you were raised is the best way. No, no, no. Truth comes to tell you, no, that's not the best way. But you can say it, but how does a person receive it if you are not a loving person, it's not just speaking the truth in love. It's being a loving person who speaks truth. It's not just a one-shot deal where you try to say it nice and sweet. but Because you know you can be nice nasty. You can say something and cut in a sarcastic way even though you haven't raised your voice. You know, even though you're smiling, whatever. But when you speak to the person and they know you love them, yeah. that's the thing. They know that you know the game. You know what's going on, but they're speaking the truth to you. Even though you don't like the truth, you know you'll not be thrown away. That's what he's talking about. Jesus, Jesus deals with us all the time. Is that right, Reverend Pat? He works on us and convicts us and jacks us up. But we know when we get up in the morning, Jesus is going to still call you daughter. He's going to still call you son. That's what we mean by speaking the truth in love. Not just giving information. Not just parsing the verb and making it clear. Because many people can intellectually and academically break the truth down. But is there love emanating from your heart? That even though you have to say this, you're not enjoying it. You know what I'm saying? I have to discipline this child, but I'm not enjoying it. I'm not doing it for my own gratification. And the child knows when you love them. They may scream and holler, but they know you will not throw them away. You will not discard them like a dirty tissue. You will not throw them in the garbage. That's love, ladies and gentlemen. Knowing the words, speaking the truth, and loving the life. Did you hear me? Knowing the words about the person, speaking the truth, but loving the life. And then when you love them, you don't say to them because you want them to, to hurt, you want to punish. You know, we, we have a vindictive spirit in us, all of us. It's only the grace of God that keeps us from aiming for the jugular all the time. No, no, no. You don't aim for the jugular uh, to get gratification, to be right, to feel better. No, you're thinking about liberating the person. The truth comes to liberate the person. Every moment is a teaching moment. Every moment is an opportunity to share the truth and the love of Christ. It's not a moment to pay back. You know, we know the story of David. We know that Saul hated David. And we know that David couldn't even understand why. Except the fact that the spirit of the Lord was upon him. And Saul had lost that place with God. So he hated him. And we know that David was anointed to replace him. So you know there's a whole lot of dynamics going on. And there was a time when Saul was using the bathroom. He was incapacitated. 
And he, his, even, even his men told him, this is it. It's the will of God. It's the will of God. Didn't God anoint you? God prepared you. Now it's your time. Take your moment. <laughs> Isn't that what we say? Amen. Take your moment. And he, he went in and just cut off a piece of Saul's garment. Because as long as Saul was alive, he was still God's choice. And David recognized in the economy of heaven, when God puts somebody in place, even if they are not doing right, that's God's responsibility to remove them. And he felt such a conviction. We don't feel convictions. We just keep carrying on. Just keep cutting the garment. Just keep cutting. Just keep cutting. Just keep looking for something. Looking for something that they're doing wrong so you could discredit them. Just keep, just keep, just waiting in the cut, waiting in the cut. Huh? And David, that's why he was a great man. He wasn't a great man because he was perfect. He was a great man because he fulfilled God's purpose. Touch not the Lord's anointed and do my prophet no harm. You understand? What love will make you do that? Did he have did he did he have him where he could have taken over? Come on. He could have justified it. It's my turn now. It's my turn. I got you where I want to. God said, you don't have to fight for a turn. That's what Abigail told him. You don't have to make a fool out of yourself. Your life is wrapped up in the bundle of life with God. You don't have to get your hands dirty to win. Shadi Aman so Satya. My, 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 my. You don't have to cut somebody's throat to be right. Come on. Whatever God has for you is reserved for you. All you have to do is be in the right place, doing what God has called you to do, speaking the truth. Amen. I'm so glad to be in the house of the Lord. I am so privileged to sit and hear the wonderful things that God is doing for his people. And these are young people. Amen. And they're experiencing God. It just brings back so many memories about my early days with the Lord. They're precious. They're wonderful. And if you walk with him and endure, you'll become a giant in the faith. Amen. So all you have to do is trust the Lord and go through. Just go through it. And you, you're having a testimony. It's a horrible thing to be in the church and have no testimony. And the reason why we don't have testimony is because we don't want to suffer. That's right. Suffer produces what? Testimony. There's something else in my bag, Wanda. Yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. So now we just love the Lord. What are we going to sing? It's funny, I don't have a song, but y yes, Vaughn, you're the song leader. What are we going to sing? I feel singish. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him, heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. Singing, what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. Jesus is the God. Jesus is the God we serve. Jesus is the God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. Jesus, Jesus is the God we serve. Come on and thank the Lord that we're serving a mighty, mighty God. Amen. He takes care of the little things, and there's nothing too hard for him when you trust him. You may be seated. Thank you. Keep on testifying. These testimonies are just powerful and wonderful. And and um and Sister Claudia, 
you know, when, when, you, when you gave that testimony, it brought back so many memories. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? I remember, I, I know you heard it before, but I like to share it that when I went to church, I was going through, going through, going through, going through. About your age. Oh, never mind. I was going through. <laughs> I was going through at a young age. Amen. <laughs> and I remember, you know, I'd lost the baby. Marriage is in trouble. And I had no money. And I had, you know, this little, uh, it's not even suede. I forgot the material. It looks like it's suede, but it's not suede. And it, I'm sorry? Yeah, something like that. A little black shoe. And it had a big hole in the heel. And so I got to church, and it was early, and there was a deacon. He became a bishop, but at that time he was a deacon, Deacon Jenkins. That's um, um, Cheryl Seward's uncle. And that was a praying man. Lord, that was a praying man. And um, we got there early, and he said, we're going to ask. No, I said to myself, I don't want him to ask me to pray. Because in St. John, we knelt to pray. Because there was an altar. I said, please, God, don't let him ask me to kneel. Because there's a hole in my shoe. And as sure as I, it came out of my head, he said, we're going to ask Sister Jackie to pray. And I said, okay, God, I'm going to kneel down with this hole. But that was some kind of prayer. That's how you learn how to pray. Pray with holes in your shoes. What? That prayer took me to another level. And I always remember that. So always thank God for those moments. Those are the moments that make you what you are today. I needed that stripping so that when I do have a new pair of shoes, I don't act like, you know, I, I'm, I got it going on. Every time I look at the shoes, I say, Lord, I thank you. I remember how you brought me out. Tell your neighbor, I remember how he brought me out. I remember. You need to remember. You need to have good memories. Just make memories. Many of, many of us are so entitled. We are rottingly entitled. Amen. We can't praise God. We can't be faithful. We can't do what he, or we can do what we want to do, but we don't want to be faithful to him. We want to have everything that everybody else has. Because we're limited. Yeah. But when you can serve him and be faithful, show up and worship. And then after I got, got through praying, I started shouting. Because you know, that's all we did in St. John, we shout. You know, you, you pray until you shout. You're praying to a shout. Because mm -hmm. the mothers used to tell you, you're not praying until you get the joy. Did you get the joy, joy, little girl? That means that you prayed yourself into agreement with God. Oh, what wonderful days. What wonderful days. I wouldn't trade those days for anything. So, Sister Claudia and all of you who are going through, enjoy these days. Because that's why some people can't endure anything. They get anointed. They get promoted. And then they get weary. And then they get entitled. And then they mess up. But when you've got that kind of testimony, you stay on track. Lord, have mercy. Thank God for it. I got a thousand stories. Amen. I thank God for those testimonies. We're going to give us unto the Lord, but we thank God for our visitor. You're not a visitor anymore. We're just glad to see you again. Amen. We know you're not a visitor. Is it Philadelphia? North Carolina. North Ca I don't know why I'm putting you in Philadelphia. Every time I see you, I see you. In but anyway, mm -mm, strike that from the record. <laughs> but it's so good. <laughs> It's so good to have you. You're always welcome. You're always welcome. Amen. And you're no stranger to my craziness, so it's good that you're here. You're not intimidated. Amen. If you have your offering, you have your offering, please stand. Sweet, um, no fool, pick that up. Yeah, your name is no fool from now on. You're no fool. Amen. Slap your chest and say no fool. Everybody stand. <laughs> He's mine, so I could say that. Right, 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 sweetheart? Yes, I know, yes. Okay. Hey, 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 Sister Gabby. Praise the Lord, Sister Gabby. Hi, hi, darling. Hi, yeah, no, mm, yeah. Right. <laughs> Serious job, serious assignment. assignment. Lord, we thank you for every gift. And Lord, tonight we're just rejoicing, rejoicing because you are such a mighty God. 
you're in your prayer answering God. Thank you for giving cars. Thank you for maintaining cars. Thank you for watching over cars. Thank you for protecting cars. Lord, even in the midst of all of this, thank you for watching over this house. Thank you, God, that you're going to keep us and preserve our bodies, the atmosphere, everything in this house belongs to you. So we're asking you to cover us as we drop the money in the basket. You promised to rebuke the devourer. Lord, I thank you, God, that you're rebuking right now, that you're setting boundaries. My God, telling the devil, permission not granted. Thank you for it tonight. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Come all, come from the back, singing and praising the Lord. God is good. God is good. God is good to me. How can I let him down? How can I let him down? How can I let him down? He's been so good to me. Save my soul. Save my soul. Save me whole. Save my soul from sin. How can I let him down? How can I let him down? How can I let him down? He's been so good to me. Oh, sing, God is good. God is good. He's so good. God is good. God is good to me. How can I let him down? How can I let him down? How can I let him down? He's been so good to me. Oh, he saved my soul. Save my soul. Made me whole. Save my soul from sin. How can I let him down? 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 He's been so good to me. Me, I will not. Me, I will not suffer loss. I will. I will not beg for prayer. praise and worship, the testimonies, the scripture reading, and now we're going to hear the word of the Lord. You know, Sunday night service, the enemy can make you very poopy, very tired, but somewhere in the midst of all of it, there is a word. Amen? Amen. Just like you have three meals a day, some of you eat eight times a day for your body. Amen? Yeah. And the nutritionist said you should eat small meals frequent small meals in order to lose weight. Well, you need to eat many meals a day so you could gain weight in the Lord. Amen? Amen. So we have Reverend Anthony Jackson. We're just so happy to have him here and his wife and daughter. Amen. And I remember when Reverend Anthony Jackson walked through this door. You remember? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Everybody should remember how they walked through this door. Amen. And uh, uh, <laughs> and when he walked through the door, yes. And I met him at the door. Praise the Lord. And um, it's all she wrote. Praise the Lord. Amen. So we move on from there. But I've watched him go through the thick and the thin. And I've watched the Lord carve him like you carve a turkey. Whittle him like the artist whittle 
a statue out of a piece of wood. And he's still whittling him. Amen? Amen. So I'm asking you to pray for him as he delivers this word, not from a place of distance from the Lord, but from a place of nearness to the Lord. Won't you stand and receive Reverend Anthony Jack? All right, y'all can give the Lord a hand clap now. Somebody praise God for me this evening. I need you to praise him for me this evening. Our scripture tonight is coming from 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. If you're in need of a Bible, please raise your hand. And the ushers will be more than glad to assist you. Gabby is raising her hand. First Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. Here beginneth the reading of God's holy word. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. So far the text. You may be seated. Giving honor to God tonight who is the head of my life. I thank God for this opportunity that he has given me once again. To stand behind this sacred desk. I thank God for our bishop who loves on us each and every day, who prays for us. Sorry, you can give her a hand clap. When you're going through it, that's the woman of God that's praying for you. Our overseer, because after she finished praying, we need counseling. The prayer don't always get us through, <laughs> but the counselor will bring it home. It's like hitting first and second base. Somebody got to bring it home. I give honor to Pastor Hyman and his wife and all the pastors and Pastor Angel and Pastor Nadine, all leaders, God's people, our guests. Thank God for the streamers that are watching tonight. I thank God that my lovely wife is in the house tonight. You know, it's so weird. I, let me tell you this little thing. The, the, the last, uh, about a month or two ago, I don't know why, I was just sitting down and I was talking to the Lord. And you know, most of the time my wife is trying to get home so we can get Gabby in the bed and I understand. And it just came over me, I want my wife to be in the next time I preach. I never said that to her. And she said to me yesterday, I think I'm going to stay for you to preach. She's a wise woman. <laughs> you, you see how good God is? He pays attention to the little things. And I said, baby, I can't believe that. I thought about that. I thank God for Gabriella. Lady Gaviella, I love you, boo-boo. And, and I love all of y'all in here tonight. You know, I, I was just thinking about my church home and thinking about the people of God. And, you know, we, we have a tendency to say things just to say them. I, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. I love each and every one of y'all in here tonight. And I thank you. I thank you for tolerating me at times. I thank you for praying with me. And I just thank God for the fellowship that we have with one another. My, sub my subject tonight is God is not finished yet. God is not finished yet. There are many theories about the authorship of 1 Samuel. Some say Samuel was the author while others disagree considering the fact that Samuel dies in chapter 25. So some scholars give credit to the prophets Samuel, Gad, and Nathan. Key personalities in the book includes Eli, Hannah, and Samuel. Saul, Jonathan, and David. Part of the author's intention was to show how Israel chose a king. And in the process, they shamely neglected and abandoned God. First Samuel is a story of narrative history and includes a great deal of drama. 
you know, we like to get on the phone and talk. But you know, you, you, know, you don't have to talk to people and gossip if you want to get some drama. Just, just, just read the book of Samuel. Read, read the Bible. It's full of drama. The book starts with the miraculous birth of Samuel in answer to his mother's prayer, a barren woman who was provoked by her adversary because the Lord had shut up her womb. The Bible says that her heart was grieved and she was in bitterness of soul. And as a result of her pain, she prayed unto the Lord that if he would look on her affliction and remember her, by giving her a man child that she would give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. And the Bible said that Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Somebody say, God is not finished yet. As a child, Samuel lived and served in the temple. God singled him out as a prophet. In chapter 3, verse 19 through 21, it says, And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did not let none of his words. Can you imagine a flawless prophet? One that when he comes and bring a word, you know it's going to come. Listen, there was a time I used to, and I'm not saying it still doesn't happen, but there was a time I used to be scared to hear my name called over the pulpit. <laughs> Y'all don't know what that's like because she done settled in now. You see, she wasn't always settled in. He was, she was an evangelist when she first started a few couple of years. And, and, and cutting you didn't matter. And if I heard the name Anthony or Reverend Jackson or whatever she called me. Sometimes she didn't even have to call your name. You knew she was talking to you. A word would come across the pulpit and shaking knees. Hands shaking and worried about what... And see, I, I, I know y'all always looking for prophecy, but when you learn what a real prophet does, you won't be looking for a prophet all the time. See, see Samuel, his first prophecy, he, 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 he declared doom in Eli's house because his sons, the priests, was acting up in the temple. He, they, they were immoral and they had greed. So, so, so when a prophet comes here, it's not always about houses and, and cars and, you know, the Lord. Sometimes it's not even about the Lord is healing you, but he comes with correction. And he comes with instruction. So I, so I don't know where they get this thing from where, you know, people running after prophet. I don't run after no prophet. Because a real prophet, if you really want a word, you're asking God to help you in your situation. And give you instructions so that you can live this thing right. And Samuel was that kind of prophet. He, he, he was that kind of prophet. Just to give you a few accounts of what was going on in 1 Samuel. The Israelites was going to war with perennial enemies, the Philistines. The Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant and are in temporary possession of it. But when the Lord sends judgment. Oh God, this book is full of stuff, boy. You know what kind of judgment the Lord said? Mice and hemorrhoids. Can you, can, can, listen. Okay, let, let, me keep, let me keep going because I can turn that into a message right there. You know, you, 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 you covenant the word of God and you, you want something that you think you want, but you don't know if that's what you really want because when you get what you want, you don't know what that thing turns out to be. I know some of y'all, y'all don't know what I'm talking about, but some of y'all know y'all asked for some things and once you got it, you was hoping that you did not have it. <laughs> but when the Lord sends judgment, the Philistines return the ark. They return the ark. They return the ark. <laughs> Samuel calls Israel to repentance in chapter 7, verse 3 to 6, and then victory over the Philistines. Samuel served the Lord from his childhood. He was a prophet, priest, and judge. He was one of the last judges. The biblical account of Samuel's service as a judge over Israel states when he became old, he appointed his sons, Joel and Abiai, to be judges, but he turned aside and began accepting bribes to pervert the course of judgment. Times don't change. What, what is the biggest problem that we have with the prophets and the priests and the preachers these days? Greed and immorality. Greed and immorality. If you want to watch out for anything in your life at this present time, be careful. 
that you don't find yourself desiring greed and walking in immorality. The people of Israel wanting to be like other nations desired a king. Samuel is displeased, displeased by their demands. But the Lord tells him that it is not his leadership they are rejecting, but the Lord's. After following God's instructions and warning the people of what having a king would mean, Samuel anoints a Benjamite named Saul as king. Even though they knew what the repercussions would be, what the consequences would be. Isn't, isn't, isn't that like you, you, you come to church week after week and you, and you hear the preacher preaching what the consequences is going to be if, if you decide to go in that direction. But it's just something in us. I didn't say you. I said it's something in us. That we always have a desire to be like somebody else. To want with other people. And, and, and you know, and I can't really say that I have that desire. You know, we all have different desires. I don't want what other people want. But there's something that I want that God doesn't want me to have. So we all find ourselves there. The people of Israel wanting to be like other nations desire the king. Samuel is displeased by their demands. But the Lord tells him that it's not his leadership. They reject him, but the Lord's. So from chapter 8 to 15, we read of Samuel continuously warning Israel to choose God over man. He did his best to point people to the Lord, but the people were so stubborn. Despite Samuel standing as the man of God during his time, people still wanted what they wanted. So in chapter 11, you see Saul enjoys his success. Defending the Ammonites in battle, but then he makes a series of blunders or misjudgments as he presumptuously offers a sacrifice in chapter 13. He makes a foolish vow at the expense of his own son, Jonathan, in chapter 14. And in chapter 15, he disobeys the Lord's direct command. Y all, y all, y all, most of y'all know this story. So Samuel said to Saul, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Oh, God, I can't go past that. Can, can you imagine every time you find yourself rebelling against God? The word is saying that you're doing witchcraft. You're like a witch. You're trying to be in control of a situation that you are not in control of. You've decided that you don't want to do what God has called you to do. And he said, it's, just, it's like the sin of witchcraft. Not only that, he said, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And most of the time, rebellion and stubbornness go together. So what he's saying is, not only are you trying to be in control of the situation, but you're considering yourself more than what God is telling you to do. And as a result... Samuel said to him that thou has rejected the word of the Lord and he has rejected you from being king. So then Samuel went and cleaned up Saul's mess and settled some issues for God and he went home and mourned. The man of God who's been serving God for years, prophecy coming forth. He didn't even mourn when his own sons were rejected. But yet and still he went home and mourned when Saul was rejected. The Bible says that he didn't see him again until death. And God said that he regretted that he made Saul king. The text, how long? Oh God, how long will you mourn for Saul? I'm not going to be before you, Lord. It's almost over. Now, and, and let's look at mourning. Because I don't want you to confuse mourning with other. You know, I, I thought mourning and grief was the same thing. And I learned that grieving and mourning is a different situation. Now, mourning is typically, it's an expression of the heart. When someone has died or something of value has been taken away from us. It's an expression of the heart. When someone dies or something of value 
has been taken away from us. It's an outward expression of an inward pain. An outward expression of an inward pain or affliction. It's the state of being in deep grief. Morning, morning, morning. In chapter 15, verse 10, the word says, Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, I repented me that I have set Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me and have not performed my commandments, and it grieved Samuel. So, 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 Samuel didn't just get in a place of mourning. Before he got there, he was in a place of grief. Oh, God. And he cried all night long to the Lord. Why did he cry? Because grief is when somebody is suffering, is when they're hurting and when they're in pain. And look at this. This was, this was interesting to me. One of the meanings said to heat oneself into vexation. So, so, so what it's saying is that you have acknowledged or your perception of a situation has given you the ability to take yourself there. That's why, that's why when we say, um, when, when somebody dies, we grieve differently yeah. because we hope in the Lord. So what you have done, you have made a decision that I'm not going to allow myself to be like others. Why? Because I have hope in God. So I'm not going to allow myself to go there. I'm not going to heat up my and stir up my anger in such a way that it's going to have control over me and make me feel a certain kind of way. Immediately when you find yourself in a situation like that, I'm, I'm admonishing you to go to scripture and apply the scripture to your life. Because if you find yourself there and you stay there, you're going to graduate to mourning soon. So you need to go to Isaiah 40 and 29. He gives power to the faint and to him who has not might, he increases his strength. Or, or, or maybe you can go to Psalm 73 and 26. My flesh and my heart may fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Or maybe you can go to John 16 and 33. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. To the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Now, we live in the world, and we have tribulation in the world, but if you find yourself in Christ, you'll have the peace that you need, even though you're living in the world. But because he allowed his grief to manifest itself, to linger. Yeah, y'all yeah, know how that is. Y'all get in situations, and, and you just sit on it. You entertain your grief. You fellowship with your grief. Oh, God, I thank you. Mm. Oh, God. There's a graduation going on. Some of us get in situations we start to counsel ourselves. In our, no, no, we call grief partners. We get on the phone and we all you got to say is one or two things and you know they're going to go there. We make phone calls to the wrong people. Because instead of them giving us a scripture and bringing us out of the situation, they go, child, you, you, you know what? Yeah, mm, I, I told you. You, you know that. Oh, come on, you shouldn't have never. Why, why call somebody that's going to help you heat up the vexation that's going on inside of you? Why, why, why call somebody that's not going to help you to come out, but to continue to bring you in something that does not please God? So that's, that's, where, that's where Samuel found himself. Not only was he grieving, but he graduated to mourning. Now, now, now I know God had a problem with it. Because it, it, I was reading somewhere in the scholar, one of the scholars says God limited his people's expressions of mourning to keep them from copying the paganism of other nations. That, that, that's the word, y'all. He limited the amount of time that you would be able to mourn. He limited you know, some people got 30 days when, when, when somebody died. Some, some of you would give them seven days and he, he would give them two. He didn't allow you to find yourself in a situation where you can just continue to go on and on. You know how sickening it is to be around somebody who every time you talk to them, they don't have nothing good to say? The law forbade the Israelites. Check this out. Check this out. 
in scripture, the Lord forbade the Israelites to cut themselves. So what he's saying is, when you find somebody who's cutting on their flesh, they're mourning. The Bible also says, tattooing themselves, they're mourning. Oh, God. Can you imagine? If, if you're tattooing yourself, you're, you don't move from grief to mourning. I know some of y'all don't believe that, but check, check your history in your mind. Check the things that you think. Check, check the reason why you even did it. Check the history. Check. Nobody goes to the tattoo shop for no apparent reason and decides to put something on their flesh. Nobody. No. The Bible says that you're grieving. The Bible says that God does not want his people to be like the paganists. By cutting their fleshes and, 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 and putting tattoos on their bodies. Why? Because they're grieving. They're, they're, they're grieving. They're grieving. And, and, and some people, when, when we're grieving, we're not, when, we might not be cutting our flesh and we may not be tattooing our bodies, but we're paralyzed. Oh, God, we're, para we're paralyzed. We, we, we can't move. We can't, we can't do anything for the Lord. Nobody can't call on you for nothing. And, and it, was in, it was 15 and 35 where, 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 where Samuel said that he was mourning. And, and it was the next verse that the Lord said, how long? I, I don't know how long it was, but I know it was too long. How, however long it was, it was too long. And, and I can only imagine that it, the Bible says that he went home and mourned. So he must have turned off the lights. He must have been in the house by y'all. know how y'all do when y'all mourning. You don't want to be bothered and you don't answer the phone. You don't want to cook. You don't want to bathe. You don't want to do nothing. Because you become paralyzed. Listen, this, this is some serious. The Lord is after the mourners in the house today. The, the, the Lord is after the mourners because the, the, the mourners are creating havoc in the house today. Oh, God. I, I still don't understand why Samuel was mourning when he didn't even mourn after his own kids. But I know some of us, we mourn because we blame God. We, we, we blame God for situations that has happened in our lives. We, we blame God. And, and Samuel had an opportunity to blame God too, you know. Because it was God who told him to anoint Saul. It was God who said that he gave him another heart. It was God who said that this will be the king of my people. So he knew God knew that he was going to mess up. There was, there was a time while he still lived in Pennsylvania. And, and, and the Lord told me to move. I know y'all heard this story, so, you know, indulge me for a minute. The Lord told me to move. And, and I didn't want to move. Because it didn't make sense to me to move. Because when I live in Pennsylvania, you know, I could make up numbers. I'm paying $1,000 rent. And then when I move to New York, I'm going to pay $3,000 rent. And we only talking about the rent, so it didn't make sense to me to move. Then he gave me a dream, and the dream gave me clear indication that it's time to move. Now, when I moved, all hell broke loose. Y'all... Y'all know my story? Y'all was praying for me when the, when the car accidents kept going. I, I, some people look at me and go, Reverend Jackson, can you drive? <laughs> I had more car accidents in two years than people had in a lifetime. And I had an opportunity to say, but God, you told me to move. And one day I remember sitting on the couch after about the second year, we're struggling. We have no insurance. We moved. We're struggling. My wife doesn't have a job, and I don't have a job. And I'll never forget, my wife looked at me, and she said, why you look like that? I said, what you talking about? Because I was sitting down talking to the Lord. But what she was saying is, I know you ain't mourning, are you? The reason why is because when you find yourself in a position like that, you're really saying, I don't trust God. And a lot of us don't trust God. We, 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 we don't trust God. We, we, so Samuel might have been concerned about the people's expectations and their desires. 
Because I know he cared about. And a lot of us, that's some of our issues as well. We're more concerned about other people and family members' expectations and desires than we are concerned about what God is doing in our lives. And because of that, we're ineffective in the kingdom of God. Our family members. I don't know, Sam, you might have been concerned about that because there was a time where Saul asked him after he rebuked him and told him what God was doing, he asked him to come and pray. And he said, no, I ain't going with you. And then he took care of God's business. But then Saul asked him again and he went. Why did he go the second time? What, what, what was the reason? What, he said, so that we can go before the people. And a lot of us are people pleasers. And if the people are not pleased, you're mourning. You're not satisfied with what God thinks. You're more concerned about what people think. Let me tell you something. When I got saved, and not when I got saved, when I became a minister, Bishop used to take us in the back. We used to, y'all, y'all didn't have no, no, we had children's church back there. We had everything back there. Me and Pastor Nadine, we had children's church. So while somebody's preaching, we back there teaching the children. And then one time we had a meeting, and Bishop said something about, you know, go back in your, in your childhood. See, see, a lot of y'all wonder why we always want to go back in, because that's where most of that stuff comes from. A lot of us are mourning because of stuff of our childhood. Our mama left us, somebody touched us in a room. And, you know, and, and, and I'm not discounting the things that has happened to people. But God never intended for you to be mourning and stuck in a situation like that. So Bishop said, you know, think of something that's holding you back or something like that. I don't know. I came up with a letter about my mama. My mama. She taught me how to be prideful. And it wasn't a godly pride. And when I wrote the letter, and most of us was back there crying and boohooing about the things that we come to realize that's been holding us back and hindering us from growing and moving forward for the Lord. And I called her on the phone. I said, Mommy. You know, um, you know, they did this thing in church, and you know, uh, and um, you know, I just, I just wanted to talk to you about this because it's, it's been holding me back. It's been holding me back. This pride thing you taught me, and and and, and because if you taught me pride, you know, I, I even have a way of talking to people where I'm being straightforward. And, she, and the first thing she come up, well, ain't nothing wrong with telling the truth. Listen, y'all, y'all don't know the old folks there. And I started to think about it. I'm trying to explain to you how I'm getting delivered from something that God is not pleased with. And all she telling me and back to supporting what it is that. So I, I just got off the phone. I just, just got it. Because I had to realize it had nothing to do with her. It was all about what position I was in and the mourning that I was doing that was making me ineffective in the kingdom of God. And God was saying, how long? How long? How, 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 how long? How long? How long? Maybe, maybe Saul was mourning because of the time invested into Saul. Maybe, 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 maybe he was mourning because he invested a lot of time. He invested a lot, a lot of time, and uh, you know, a lot of us has invested a lot of time and and stuff that we desired. You know, the Bible says, "How long will y'all will you mourn for Saul?" You know what Saul means? Saul means desired. So, so, so I can hear God saying, "How long are you going to continue to mourn for that that you desire?" And we have things that we have invested in that we so desire. But because God has nothing and he's rejecting it and he will not have nothing to do with it, we find ourselves paralyzed and standing still and, and, and mourning and being in effect. Listen, once we start dealing with some of this grief and the things that we're mourning for, our relationships will change. The community will change. The unity will change. The type of relationships that we have with one another will change the way we talk to one the reason why we having a lot of issues that we're having is because most of us are mourning silent mourning 
We won't let people go. We won't let pain and affliction that people have pressed upon us go. We won't let it go. We, we won't let it go. But I'm here to tell you tonight, God is not finished yet. He, he's not finished yet. I remember a story about Nathan and David. Where David sent Uriah out there to get killed because he was doing the nasty with his wife. You know, some, some, some of our mourning is because we're, we're, we're still in sin. We're still in identifiable, clear, rebellion and sin. A lot of witchcraft in the house. A lot of, lot of witchcraft in the house. And, and, and Nathan came and confronted him. And he told him what the judgment would be. And one of the things that he told him was that you won't die. We, 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 God is going to let you go. But that child that you have So Nathan, so, 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 so Nathan decreed a thing, declared a thing on his household, and, and, and David went, and, and he was feeling some kind of way. He was, he was grieved about what God has decided that he was going to do. So he went and laid down on the floor and, 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 and prayed and fasted for seven days. When his men came, he didn't talk to them. He didn't want to have nothing to do with them. He didn't want to eat. He didn't want to do nothing. For seven days. For seven days. But then the child died. So I don't, I don't believe that God doesn't, the saying that you can't mourn. But he gives you a certain amount of time to be able to do what you need to do for you to get yourself. We, we shouldn't be still mourning about what happened 15 years ago. And we can't talk to people and treat people a certain kind of way because of what happened to me. When God has given you liberty and freedom to love one another. The Bible says, then David arose from the earth. Some of us need to just get up and get out of that situation. And he washed himself. You know, because when you, when, when, when you ain't doing right and when you, and when you don't want to have nothing to do with nobody, a lot of times we don't wash up ourselves. We don't clean up ourselves. And not only just wash himself, but wash himself to prepare himself to do what he really needed to be doing. Clean, clean, up, clean up yourself. You, you stink it. We, we, we stink. Do, do you know when you find yourself mourning and, and treating people a certain kind of way and you acting, you stink. He mourned for seven days and he had to get up and clean up himself because he was stinking. You stink. And we know when you stink, people don't want to have nothing to do with you when you're stinking. And, and, and I know some of you, know, we, we, we have issues with certain people, but you can't tell me half of the house is telling you stinking and you ain't stinking. There's something, something, something wrong. Reverend Nady, Pastor Nady might not like me, so she goes, mm, you got a little smell. Maybe it's my cologne. Maybe she just don't like me. But I can't get half of this sex and tell me I'm stinking and I don't see that I'm stinking. But see, that's what happens when you find yourself mourning in such a way. So then David arose from there. He got up. He washed himself. Not only did he wash himself, he anointed himself. And he changed his clothes and he came out the house and he went unto the Lord and started to worship God. And that's what some of us need to do. We need to really truly worship God because we need something from God. So God, he said, how long will you mourn for Saul? Seeing that I have rejected him from reigning over Israel. God wants you to agree with him tonight. Agree with him. He's rejecting anything that's reigning and ruling over your life, and it's not him. They wanted to be like other people and have a king, but God never intended for anything besides him to rule and reign over our lives. So what is the answer? To that? What are we supposed to do? Fill up thy horn with oil and go. Get over it 
and get up and be about your father's business. God had someone in mind for Samuel to anoint as king. It wasn't over. It wasn't finished. It wasn't finished. As a prophet, he probably should have kept his horn filled with oil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why did he even find himself without the oil? And see, that's why a lot of us have issues because we're empty. Did you pray this morning? Did you spend time with the Lord? Is the Holy Ghost filling you on a day-to-day -day basis? Is your horn... Or you said, what, 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 what horn? Okay, let me, let me bring it in a spiritual sense. So the word fill means to be full of and to furnish. Follow me now. The word fill means to be full of and to furnish. The word horn in the Hebrew means a flask or a container, a receptacle. And it is figurative of power. Totally spiritually speaking, today, we are the horn, the receptacle of power, and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So God is saying that he wants you to fill yourself with the wisdom and the knowledge of the God that we serve. The anointing of God. The Holy Spirit that instructs us and leads us and guides us and gives us understanding. The believer can be full of hurt and pain, or you can be full of the Holy Spirit. We have to make a decision today. We should be full of the Holy Spirit so God can furnish us with what we need to get the assignment done. The Holy Spirit is there to furnish us with whatever we need and fill us up. We need help, he's going to fill us up. We need grace, he's a filler. We need strength, he's a filler. We need instruction, he's a filler. The Holy Spirit provides it. The Spirit anoints us for ministry in Luke 4 and 18. The Spirit brings liberty in 2 Corinthians 3 and 17. The Spirit washes and renews us in Titus 3 and 5. Lamentations 3, 22 to 23 says, It is the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Are you drawing on his new mercies every morning? How can we still find ourselves in a stupor for years to come and years to go? Talk about we praying, we praying, we praying. God ain't moved yet. God is not finished yet. Samuel must have thought, this is it. I did what God told me to do, and it just didn't work out. And found himself in a situation where he felt that God was finished. But God is not finished yet. The Bible says in Philippians 1 and 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So I know some of us feel like giving up and feel like, you know, th th this, this is my portion. But I'm telling you, God is not finished yet. Isaiah 30 and 18 and the Message Bible says, but God's not finished. He's waiting around to be gracious to you. He's gathering strength to show you mercy. God takes the time to do everything right. Everything. Those who wait around for him are the lucky ones. And then my conclusion. The Bible says, fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have provided for me a king among my sons. The problem is that the people always wanted what they wanted. They always had their own desire. They even got a king named Desired. 
And the thing about that is God let them have what they asked for. But after it failed, after all, has, after they recognized, because some of us had not even recognized this all failing. We're still trying over and over. God has decided, I have a choice now. I have a king that I have provided for me that would rule and reign over my people. God wants to have a choice in your life. He wants you to give him the ability to decide what's good for you. If we wouldn't have had King David, we wouldn't have never had Jesus. My question to you is, what are you missing out on? Because you want what you want. When God is saying, I want to provide for me what I want for you. It might not have been working out all this time. And some of us, we're going to leave here today and realize that we're mourning. And we're stuck. But I have one thing to say to you tonight. God is not finished yet. God bless you. Glory to God. Amen. All right. All right. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Because this is good, 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 good food. Yeah. Put your hands together for Reverend Jackson. Sweet, good, 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 good. Amen. Don't you take these, these messages because it's a Sunday night at 630. You know what I'm saying? And just skip over it. That food was so delicious. Amen. Some of us are, we live a life of mourning. Didn't have this, could have had that, want this, this should have happened. And we don't even know we're almost chronically, spiritually depressed. Amen. And when we're like that, we're useless. Lord, Lord can't use that. Because we're so self-absorbed. So going inward, going inward, going inward to protect ourselves, to, as Pastor Robin preached this morning, to build a garrison around our pet peas, our pet thoughts, our pet preferences, our offenses, our needs, that we're missing out on the graciousness of God. He's got so many good riches and wonderful promises for us. But it's not that they can't work. Is that we are still mourning. Mourning. We're grieving. You hear it all the time. You hear it. And you get to a certain point, you know, and you can't move. Listen to me. The day when you get to the scripture says, he has given me the oil of gladness. A garment of praise instead of mourning. A shining crown instead of ashes and glory in the midst of despair. You see, now that takes fighting. You, you can't have that scripture and just, you know, you do a great um, testimony on Sunday. And then next Friday night, you out in the club smoking marijuana. Something wrong. You grieving and mourning. Let me tell you, let me, let me give you a little hint. You ain't going to never get it. What you're looking for, you're going to smoke yourself to death because you ain't going to never get it. Smoke on. Smoke on, baby. Smoke yourself into oblivion because you ain't going to never get that man. That man don't want you. Wow. <laughs> he don't even want to know your name. You understand? That job that you want, you'll never get it. That's not where God wants you. Your mother, even if you went to her like Antoine Fisher and talked to her, she won't even know what you're talking about. Reverend Jackson's mama didn't know what she t was talking about. It, it, what, what are you talking about? Boy, shut up. Huh? She had no clue that he had been delivered. These people don't know you. Just because they brought you in the world, they don't know you. They can't handle you. They were just an egg and a sperm. 
you running after an egg and a sperm. They, don't, they, have, they have no clue the greatness that God has dropped inside of you. The Bible said, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And if you don't believe it, you're going to live that same raggedy life. Right in the church, raggedy, looking raggedy, talking raggedy. Don't wear them rags in here no more. And you know what I'm talking about. Don't wear them raggedy stuff in here no more. I'm warning you. Don't wear them raggedy things by your knee in here no more. Take them rags out of here. Mourn privately, but don't mourn up in here with that. All I'm saying, 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 and Vanessa, you know what to do. All I'm saying is. Morning will suck the life out of you. 